Hello, and welcome to Virtual Investor Conferences. My name is Matt Lateplo, and on behalf of OTC Markets, we're very pleased you have joined us for our next live presentation from Candente Copper Corp. Before I introduce our speaker, a few points to note. Please submit your questions in the question box to the left of the slides. If you are interested in meeting with Candente Copper, please click on the Schedule Meetings tab found in the platform navigation bar. You'll be able to view the company's availability and submit a meeting request. On a final note, all of today's presentations will be recorded and available for 24-7 replay. At this point, I am very pleased to welcome Giulio Bonifacio, Executive Chair of Candente Copper Corp, which trades on the OTCQB venture market under the symbol DNCUF and on the TSX under the symbol DNT. Welcome, Giulio. Thank you very much, Matt, and uh, thank you for all that uh, have taken the time this morning to call in. We've got a, a, a 30 minute slot here, so I want to take you through some of the important information about the company. And then uh, at the end, for the, the last five or 10 minutes, we can get into a Q&A. Cadente Copper Corp, clearly a, a company that, that I've followed for a long, long time as a shareholder, then as a director and non-exec chair, and, and recently stepped in as executive chair. I've known Joanne Fries for a number of years, and, and you know, arguably she's done a fantastic job building the project getting it to what is a very, very large resource. The advanced technical studies, I think, will be of, of great importance to us. Um, there are changes coming. Um, you know, I think we're moving to the next chapter, and I think it's a very exciting period. I am a, a, a rather large investor. Um, I understand the copper space. I've done well in my past two transactions, and, and I've always looked at this company, the asset, and come to the conclusion very early on that this is a, an asset that's got good size potential, further growth. And I do, I do want to talk about that a little bit, but also what it currently represents, um, you know, from a dollar standpoint to replicate the data, to replicate the resource, to replicate the, the, the extent of the technical studies done at, at the highest standard by Joanne Fries and, and Sean Waller, who was the previous president, but still a key director and advisor of the company. Um, to replicate that body of work, um, you know, would be very, very costly. And you know, my my guesstimate on what that would cost is probably you know 125 to 150 million dollars. Our market valuation is very, very modest. We do expect that to change. Uh, you know, new investors are starting to appreciate what we have in front of us. And you know, let's not lose sight of the EV thematic and decarbonization of the planet and, and why copper prices are trading where they're at currently and and what they could be trading at. But you know, at this price point. And we'll show that shortly. Uh, the economics on this project are fantastic. We have a very, very large shareholder in Fortescue. They have a 25% interest. And, and I do want to answer one question quickly. That is not a blocking interest. Um, we have worked with them over the last six months to come up with the, the right ingredients relative to what we need to do as a company. Uh, myself and Joanne Fries work very, very closely together. We've got a strong, strong team. But as you can sense and see, you know, there's a real interest on Fortescue relative to this asset because there's not many 16 billion pound deposits. And, and I do want to touch on that a little bit. When you look at how I get to that 60, 16 billion pounds, it's 14 billion pounds of copper, 4 million ounces of gold and, and 92 million ounces of silver. Those byproduct credits are of great value to us relative to how we could potentially finance the company further. And, and that's, you know, an area that we're going to start considering further. Um, there's good opportunity on the project as well. There's no royalties other than a 0.5% royalty, which from a burden perspective is, is very, very modest. We are changing the name to Alta Copper Corp. We are doing a four for one share consolidation. The, the message very clearly within the press release and investors I've spoken to is that should not change anything other than create a better platform for this company to move forward. When I go to the next slide, this is kind of a visual and you have to appreciate that I've been in this space for a long time involved with two other copper companies. Um, this is a good way of looking at how we trade and, and without a doubt, we trade at a, a, a significant discount and the intent clearly over the coming months is to, is to change that. These things do take time, but when you look at the 16.7 billion pounds, and again, that represents the, the copper, the gold and silver at the various equivalent pricing ratios that you factor in, you can see that, you know, on a relative basis, um, there's just a good, good opportunity. Now you look at Peru and people have commentary on community. We're making some great gains. And that gets back to, again, John Fries has been and founded this company in 2002. 
She's got fantastic relationships with the community, but you know we have not been appropriately capitalized, and that uh, that you know is something that has changed and will continue to change. And they need to understand that we're going to work with them very closely. They're going to benefit from this project, and you know communicating with all the stakeholders is part and parcel of what we need to do. Um, never to oversimplify, but I have gone through a permitting process of a, one of the larger copper projects in the American Southwest. I understand what needs to be done to advance these things and, you know, the, the fact that Joanne has these relationships, I think, will benefit from them. So I have spent some time down there as well as, you know, going through what we need to do. And we're starting to make some very, very uh, significant gains with the community. So taking that as, as, as one of the reasons that certain investors have, have pointed to the discount, I think uh, we're getting well past that. The other issue is arsenic. Clearly, that's almost amusing to a certain extent from my standpoint in that it's been dealt with in the previous pre-feasibility study in 2011 to 2012. Um, and it's also been dealt with within the recent preliminary economic assessment that we filed uh, last, uh, last March. Now, Faraday is a company that, that I was chair of for a number of years. I uh, was able to acquire an asset in 2018. Prior to that, I was the founder of Nevada Copper, capitalized that. That was a project that was fully permitted going to production. Since my departure, they've had some issues, but that worked out extremely well for many investors, and including myself. And it was a point in time for me to step aside when a group came in and acquired plus 50% of the company. Faraday acquired a project called Copper Creek, was able to bring in a fantastic group that has done a fantastic job advancing it. And that company has traded up significantly from a market cap of 40 to close to 200 million. And I think that will continue to move forward. I'm still a very, very large shareholder of that company and very, very pleased with uh, the progress that's been made. When we move to the next slide, where do we sit? Well, from a great perspective, we have one of the larger resources in, in, in South America. We also have a very good grade, but you know, factor in that the strip ratio is 0.66 to one, and, and you can understand that if anything, the margins on this project, the economics are, are, are very, very favorable. In the press release we put out last week, and it's key, name change, share consolidation, but did a private placement at a premium to market with Whittle Consulting. They're going to be part of the optimized preliminary economic assessment that we put out in the next uh, three to five months. We're going to look at what the larger profile looks like instead of processing, processing at 40 and advancing to 80,000 tons per day. We're going to look at you know, a throughput rate of anywhere from 100 to 120,000 tons per day. The reason for that is it'll allow us to generate, you know, copper production north of 150,000 tons of copper per annum. That, that's of great interest to many groups, including the Fortis Views of the World and other groups that, that have actually approached us er, already about understanding what we're planning to do and what we intend to do on a go forward basis. So I think if anything, now is a fantastic opportunity to position oneself if you're a current shareholder or a new incoming shareholder. Upcoming value drivers, I think, you know, the point that, 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 that we put out that press release last week was to talk about, you know, getting back with the drill bit. The project has not been drilled since 2013. Cumulative drilling, 85,000 meters. Now, by comparison, other projects I've been involved with, too, I've already mentioned, and others, that's a very modest amount of drilling, and that get, that, that's credit back to, you know, the team led by, by Joanne. 85,000 meters to move to what is north of 16 billion pounds of copper all in is, is very significant, but there was very limited drilling done in, in certain areas that, that justify further drilling. And if we can create a situation that increases that tonnage, increases the entire, entire endowment and focus in on our core competencies, drill, study work, optimize the economics as we need to have the various discussions, advance the community relations as, as appropriate, enter a community agreement. If we can execute on those three initiatives, and also concurrently have various discussions with incoming groups. This is a big project for a big company, but again, replicating what we currently have would be very, very, very difficult. Moving to the next slide, third party validation. Many of you can, can you know, read that slide on your own, but clearly there's a number of third party groups that have identified Kenny Arco as a, a project that will be of great interest as we enter this next cycle and without a doubt, uh, you know, valuations will, will adjust accordingly, inclusive of what we do with uh, Cadente, soon to be renamed Alta Copper Corp. Investment highlights, we own 100% of it. It's 90 square kilometers. It's a big system. It's a large, large scale porphyry gold, copper gold, silver deposit in northern Peru. Northern Peru is a good location. There are commentaries that, that I've seen that speak to 
the community and the size of the community? Well, you know, for us, it's about the majority and how we can, you know, focus in on getting support from the majority of the community and, and bearing in mind that we've opened up offices in the various locales within the communities and the fact that we've hired locals to, to work with us on the social side, community license side, social license side is, is, is of key importance. And I think, you know, those things simply facilitate a better understanding within the community that, you know, this is their, to their net benefit. The area in which this project is located is very, very impoverished. So, you know, I think that there's a way forward and, and that's a key, key point. The, the resource, the deposit, you know, we'll get into that in a bit of detail here because I, I do want to stay within the time frame that we've been allotted. But, you know, the, the, the existing infrastructure that we benefit from, the port facilities, the ability to, 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 to ship our, our copper concentrate, the fact that the, the rock index, the rock is relatively soft, helps us across the board relative to how we could potentially, you know, move away from 40,000, going to 80,000, and consider something that's slightly larger than that. And also at the same time, keep our capex within our range. Location of the asset, um, get into Chickalayo and it's a seven hour drive to the project uh, by way of road. So uh, there's good, good access. And you know that obviously as we move towards advancing the project will improve over a period of time. Now the, the, the resource itself been asked, why would you wanna do more drilling? And, 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 and it really gets back to two factors. Firstly, when we look at Norte, which represents you know, majority of the existing resource, uh, one of the key points is that most of it's in the measured indicated category. So that, that's a, a key benefit for us. We can clearly move Norte into feasibility study and put forth what will be very attractive economics. And we likely may look at doing that. And that's to start the clock on permitting. And that will help us with the permitting scenario. However, with that said, when you look at Norte, there's many, many holes of bottom mineralization. We didn't chase some of the higher grade breaches within the system. Um, arguably we should consider doing that and we will do that on this next budgeted program that we're looking at starting at the end of this year, beginning of next year, you know, subject to timeline on permits, but we do expect to get those in within a, a reasonable time frame, and, and we're working towards that. Kenny Sur is, is of great interest. It doesn't carry any arsenic on the back of only 15 drill holes. It's already a significant resource and the, the signature Geological signatures on Verde are very much similar, but Verde has had no drilling. And so top to bottom, four kilometers, three different systems, all representing big, big porphyry systems. If we can increase what is already a large system, again, 16 billion pounds on plus a billion tonnes of material, we think there's an opportunity. And, you know, if you can create a situation that's a generational resource of significant size, um, what that does to mine life, what that does for incoming groups and, and what that does from a value prop proposition standpoint is, is, is of great importance. If you look at some of the past drilling, again, simply justifies, you know, again, the project has not been drilled for a, a long period of time, limited drilling to date on a relative basis, comparable basis. There's just a, a really, really good opportunity in my estimation. Some visuals on the project that you can look at, the resource, Again, as I noted, most of it in Norte is in the measured and indicated, excuse me, measured and indicated category, and already plus a billion tonnes and a very good grade and, and representing a significant endowment on copper, gold, and silver. And then when you factor in the inferred uh, further augments, uh, what we currently have, which is a very large resource, sir, mostly all in inferred, but nonetheless. Um, you know, as we do more infill drilling, as we step out, we, you know, we're really focused in on expansion with respect to the next drilling program, primarily focused on Sur and Verde, but we will also go back and, you know, test out some of the drill holes in Norte. This is a very interesting slide and, and something that, 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 that we should as investors and stakeholders pay attention to. Uh, the intent of last year's PEA was to put something forth that looked at a staged build, minimize the capital. And so, Started in at 40,000 tonnes per day, approximate capital cost of a billion, used the cash flow from the project to expand the project further and expand to 80,000 tonnes per day. And as you can see in the subsequent 22 year timeline at 80,000 tonnes per day, producing north of 85,000 tonnes of copper. That's a third bullet point down, third point down from the third bullet point. Um, that in itself is pretty significant. So that, that's kind of the rationalization behind what does this look like if we get back to what we previously put out in 2011, which was based at 95,000 tons per day, but operated at an annualized copper 
production platform of close to 150, 160,000 tons of copper per annum. CapEx at, at that point in time was, was a, about a billion four. Now, again, understanding that, that we need to focus in on what we can do as a company effectively and understand that the some of the larger incoming groups who are going to have great interest in projects like this that can really move their needle. And, you know, having experience in the copper space, you know, anything below 80,000 tonnes of copper per annum is usually of interest, but not as much interest. Um, a project like this can generate some significant returns. The leverage on it, very, very significant, you know, pointing to what is a very modest strip ratio helps us you know, even if you did a comparison on, you know, the grade, it's a good high grade system for an open pit and factor in that the strip ratio in itself is very modest, it gives us a, a margin on the front end that, that will generate some significant economics. The arsenic, again, it has been dealt with. It's grossly overstated, you know, when there's critiques on the company um, community, and I've touched on that and how we're advancing that arsenic. You look at the economic studies, look at the pre, pre feasibility study, look at the preliminary economic assessment, and also appreciate that for a group like Whittle Consulting to step in and do a private placement at 18 cents, which you know was approximately a 25% premium in the market, there's a reason for that. The mere fact that Fortescue has shown this much interest, there's a reason for that. And you know, if you go back to the comp slide that I put on earlier, very few of those companies on that slide have that level of interest from certain groups. Now, Whittle Consulting, you know, bar none are one of the better groups out there. But, you know, they've, they've done some extensive work on projects like uh, Lazul at McEwen, which have benefited McEwen in terms of the transactions that they've entered into. They view this project as, as, as a top tier, tier one asset. And so we will be coming out with what we think will be some very exciting news in, in the coming months. We'll follow that on with our drill permits and further drilling. And again, focus in on, on the community and, and how we advance uh, those various initiatives. Uh, but we're making very, very good progress. If you look at the uh, preliminary economic assessment that we put out back in March of last year, and let's just for discussion purposes, look at $4 copper. You can see that at $4 copper at an 8% discount factor on the back of a billion dollar CapEx, we generate $1.4 billion. Now that leverage is up nicely as copper prices go higher, but that's an after-tax number. So we think there's an opportunity from an after-tax perspective, because if you look at a pre-tax, same column, third third number down, 2.7 billion. So uh, I think we will, we'll focus in on sort of the tax calculations because we think there's an opportunity there with respects to how that should be calculated appropriately. I think we did a, a good enough job relative to what we attended, intended to do last year, but there's an opportunity there. But when we look at moving away from 40,000 going to 80,000 and, and focus in on something that because of the soft rock and the ability to, to build something at, you know, 95,000 to let's say 110,000 tons per day. The mere fact that we can produce that on the front end of the mine life and, and the returns that it will generate will be very, very significant. And so we do expect to put out what will be more favorable economics. And that's working off of the fact that we have a resource, most of which is in M&I. We have a previous pre-feasibility pre study done in 2011. We've got the footprint, we've got the framework. So we know what the various bookends look like. The one bookend is build it on a stage basis as we put forth last year. The other bookend is consider something slightly larger that actually generates more leverage and more margin on a go forward basis. Capital cost, as noted, a billion dollars at 40,000 tons per day and with expansion and self-funding by way of the project, uh, another 300 million. And that also, as you can see at the $480 million number includes sustaining. So when you look at our operating costs of $1.25 net of byproduct, that's a very low, that's at the low end of the threshold. If you factor in the sustaining to get your C1 cost, you'll see that it still creates quite a margin. Now, as we've seen with many projects that are in production, there's going to be escalation within these categories. But what it does point to is that this is a project that can carry at a copper price that's well below what we see currently. And I think copper, looking at it this morning, was trading in the 380 range. And so that's what caught my attention uh, when I was uh, when I was the founder, largest shareholder of a company called Nevada Copper that I mentioned earlier. Um, but I've been an investor in Condente for a, a period of time and I've continued to add that position. Uh, I think that, you know, when I looked at the economics, I was very impressed with the fact that, you know, it had a margin on it that could run nicely at even 250 copper. Now, 
that was based on a, a previous study, but I think what you'll see coming up is that, you know, if you look at the sensitivities, there's just a, a very good opportunity in this project at, at what we see as current copper prices. And, you know, assuming that those copper prices hold, and I, I do believe that's the case, but I also think there's an opportunity to see copper prices move forward as the EV thematic kicks in and the decarbonization kicks in. Community, we've talked about that. I think that's a, a key slide. The people slide, I mean, my, myself, I've given you all a bit of my background. Joanne Fries, without a doubt, has done a, a fabulous job, you know, even during the difficult times, keeping this company together. And again, we've known each other for a long, long time, and we were very closely together on, on, on this situation. And she asked me to step in in a more active way last June, and, and that's what I've done. And part and parcel of the discussions is, you know, how do we benefit from what we see coming in this next cycle? And, and how do we position ourselves as a company? And that, that also gets back to the purpose and desire to, to change the name, but also look at the share consolidation and, and get in front of, you know, differing groups. And, and hopefully with the investors that currently hold Cadente, they can appreciate that there is nothing but upside. There's no downside on this company based on what we have. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's the asset that drives the valuation, nothing else. And, you know, how we can advance that appropriately. Dale found our CFO, worked with me at Nevada Copper. Sean Muller, I noted earlier, was very senior within um, AMAC, stepped into Cadente as, as a key advisor, but the, the body of work that was done with him leading the charge with Joanne was, was very, very significant, and, and he's very much involved. In terms of other directors, we did reconstitute the board. Again, I stepped in as executive chair from non-executive chair in June, and unfortunately, during that period of time, there was a some concerns from our large shareholder and I was very clear that the intent from the outset was to, to move in a slightly different direction, but also consider the reconstitution of the board. So that, that was a process that, that did take a, a number of months, took, took about six months to start to finish. What we did last week was a culmination of what we started at the beginning of January. We also did a financing with Fortescue at a premium to market. Um, they've shown nothing but interest and it. it's a very, very good relationship with these folks. Um, and key point again is it's not a blocking interest relative to other opportunities and transactions we might consider and i think all shareholders should understand that we appreciate the value of the asset there was interest on their part we think we're grossly undervalued and the intent over the next 12 to 18 months is to change that and get to something that's more commensurate with our comp group if you will steve latimer banker he was one of our recent additions jerry Minard, who's no longer with fortescue uh, those are the two directors we added Christy Nicola um, is the for sole Fortescue nominee, so they have one of seven board seats, and that's also a key point to, to, to pay attention to. Miguel Anchelski um, on the committee on the permitting, he was a former Minister of Energy and Mines in Peru, and, and so he stepped on as a director and has actually helped us with the process and will continue to help us with the process. So if we have enough key people in place to, to advance this appropriately, and I think, if anything, that's of great importance uh, relative to what we're trying to accomplish here. I'm going to try and scroll back to my um, earlier slides, if I can. Um, just bear with me for a moment. I'm having a tough time with, uh, I'll just do it. I'll do it the old fashioned way, guys. My apologies. This is a slide again. Let's look at it. Let's look at where we sit. Let's look at the valuations and, and understand what this represents. And I think, uh, Simply looking at this, it gives you a good sense of why uh, there's a fantastic opportunity um, for any shareholder that steps into this company on a, on a go for it basis. I'm going to go to some of the Q&A questions um, and I will read them out because I know that the audience can't. Um, and I do want to stay within the allotted time, so we'll do this over the next five minutes. But uh, when do you expect to get permits and when would drilling commence from there? I, I think I did touch on that. Um, we're starting that process. Uh, we have started that process and, and we're hopeful to make the final application here in the coming weeks and look to get the permits by the end of the year. That could trickle to the beginning of next year. We're not looking at needing the funding for that drilling program until later in the year. So that's a key point. We have enough capital in place to you know, put forth what will be a, a major, major catalyst and that optimized PA that's uh, being worked on by both uh, Whittle Consulting and Asenko, who are a very, very good group, and they're also the group that uh, completed our PEA from last year. Um, good morning. Can you please describe what your three, six, and nine-month objectives, goals are for Ultra Gold? 
Alter Copper are, I think we laid them out, you know, effectively advance the primarily focus in on the upcoming optimized PEA and, and what that represents, because that'll be effectively the platform from which we can move forward on. And, and that's going to be a major driver from, from a valuation perspective. And if you look at PNAP discounts, you look at what we trade at on a penny per pound basis, all of which will justify some of the commentary I put forth today, all of which I will comment as well as some of it's forward looking as you'd expect it to be. Um, advancing on the community side, uh, we have not, you know, had the capital to advance those discussions that has changed. And so um, you'll see some, hopefully you see some news on that in the, in the coming months. And then, and we've touched on it as well on that press release. So I would, you know, suggest that you read the press release very, very closely in terms of what, what, what our thoughts are. Um, and nine months, I think the nine month scenario is to, to start in on a, on a drilling program, you know, within, you know, within the time frame by the end of the year, beginning of next year and demonstrate how this is a, a far larger system than some folks anticipate. Uh, this is a very good question as well. It, it, you know, as a shareholder since 2011, how can you reassure investors that dilution will not be an issue going forward after consolidation? Um, I've also been a shareholder since uh, since about 2011, 2012. I continue to acquire shares. Um, the short answer is I have a lot of skin in the game, and I'm very sensitive to dilution. Um, I look at the opportunity. Much of my compensation is paid by way of equity. Uh, and by design at a, a pretty modest level compared to what my previous compensation was. Um, I'm a shareholder and I have very much aligned views with all stakeholders. So um, for all past shareholders, and if you look at the share price chart, understandably a, a level of frustration, you know, with the share price doing what it's, what it's, what it's done. But I think now we're you know, at the next stage and, and we hope to regain that valuation that was, you know, in place years back, but dilution drives that. And, um, doing things that are appropriate, entering transactions that, that mitigate dilution, but also appreciating that all companies need, needs capital, need capital. And uh, we simply, as a company, have had very limited capital to work with. And, uh, you know, if the share price moves to a more respectable level, and, you know, if you assume a 15 cent share price and you look at a four for one, that's a 60 cent share price. I think that doesn't change my thinking on dilution. It's really about how do you get that to more acceptable level and, and do a financing at a considerably higher threshold than that. But, you know, in the interim, look at what other opportunities exist. Is there an opportunity from a royalty perspective? And we, we, we definitely think there is. Is there an opportunity from a streaming perspective? And there is. Um, are there other levers um, that we can consider to mitigate dilution? And so ho hopefully that answers your question. But no, I'm very attuned to that. That's how one makes um, a good return. And it's typically by way of equity, not by way of compensation. So uh, hopefully that, that gives you a level of comfort. And, you know, again, as time progresses, you can see um, what that might look like. Um, this is an interesting one. And, and I'm glad a person asked this. Um, why hasn't Condente been bought out by a competitor yet if the project is so attractive? Well, the short answer is many have not. If you look at the last cycle or acquisitions, you look at the current cycle, look at, look at this slide that I have on the screen. None of those companies have been acquired. Many of them don't have a big suitor like Fortescue in the background that, that has made rumblings about wanting to, to see us advance the project further. There's, there's only one reason for that. They clearly have a deep rooted interest. Um, I'll take the opportunity to say that the mere fact that they're invested should answer some of the questions on community and arsenic and you know that that rhetoric that i've seen time and time again you know we're dealing with it appropriately so i think in the next cycle you'll see this move forward the one last comment is we're not willing to do anything at this price point or even something that's considerably higher than this price point you know when i say considerably higher notional premium most transactions on the m a side get done at either a notional premium, no premium at market, or, you know, you never see premiums of hundred to 200 to 300%. Why on earth would we ever consider a discussion on, on selling this company at anything less than what this company should be valued at? And if you look back at the body of work, you look back at the resource, what it would cost to replicate, you know, I've already, you know, signaled that we think that's 125 to $150 million. And with what's coming, uh, we think that there's a fantastic opportunity to position ourselves. But, you know, arguably at the end of the day, I think that's ultimately what will happen. 
And that third party validation slide that we pointed to earlier does speak to the fact that we're arguably one of the top 10 M&A targets. So I think that's a, a very, a very valid comment. Um, I've got, I think there's one more question uh, to answer here and I'm just going to scroll back up. Um, uh, drilling permits, I think I've answered that one. Um, when do you think the why, why do you think the reason is coming trading at such a deep discount? Um, I think I think that the legacy on, on the company really is part of it. The mere fact that you know, we're entering the new chapter and we have a, a defined plan and, and we're back at work and you know call it a refresh for a lack of a better term, but I think you'll start to see us move away from that deep deep discount. You know when you look at anything in the copper space, any acquisition. You know, we're trading at less than a, a third of a penny per pound. That, that's that's ludicrous. And yet when you look at the asset, you know, it's well enough located in northern Peru. We've got good support from the community, but of course we have to demonstrate that to them in a, in a more clear way. Um, nothing, nothing that gets funded towards the community is egregious by any measure, you know, based on any project I've ever seen. And so I think you, know, you will see that change uh, as we start to also create market awareness. You know, there's a, there's been a cycle here since 2015 where um, you know many many development companies have, have lost value. Uh, the newer companies have, have actually done better um, simply because they might have projects that have been existed for an extended period of time, but uh, you know they've entertained and brought it forth to a completely different audience. And as you do that, um, there are going to be investors that look at this and understand that this is a fantastic opportunity to position and, and watch it and monitor it and add to that position on a go forward basis. And that over a period of time will, you know, very likely, and you can't guarantee any of this, but very, very likely uh, mitigate the, the deeper discount. The the drilling and the drill results, there's a couple of notable companies that have come out and they've put in some deep, deep drill holes, but the valuation has has gone through the roof. and and you know, drilling and being able to point to what that represents on, on a project that already sits on north of 16 billion pounds all in, I think is going to help us relative to, you know, introducing this to the various various groups and, you know, getting past the, the legacy and the community, which I've touched on on the arsenic, I think we'll also deal with that. I think I'm past my allotted time. So um, I want to thank everyone for uh, taking the time today to, to, to call in. And uh, as noted by Matt earlier, Please feel free to reach out and set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting if, if you want to have a deeper discussion on, on some of the details that I've put forth. Of course, within a, a limited time frame, you can only uh, touch on various points, but uh, there's a lot of detail and substance that goes behind much of what you've seen on the presentation. And so happy to take those questions.